I invite the CMA to adopt the draft decision entitled Outcome of the First Global Stocktake, contained in document FCCC slash PA slash CMA slash 2023 slash L.17. Hearing no objection, it is so decided. Well, that was the reaction in the room as the COP28 climate summit finally came to an end in Dubai. Smiles, applause, hugs, perhaps even a few tears at a landmark agreement that many of those present hailed as the beginning of the end for fossil fuel use. Why? Well, for the first time, the world has agreed to transition away from oil and gas. I'm Neil Patterson, and on this edition of The Daily, we will be asking whether the world has now been saved or if once again it's too little too late. Joining us from COP in Dubai, our science and technology editor, Tom Clark. Were you one of those wiping tears of joy from your eyes at this communique? I think I've been to a few too many of these to be quite that emotional. But this is a moment, I think genuinely fair to say, a historic agreement. If for no other reason that it has these key words, fossil fuels in it. And I know that must just sound ridiculous. This is a climate change summit. We know that the burning of fossil fuels that makes the greenhouse gases that's warming the planet is the whole problem. But for 30 years, since the beginning of this whole process, we've never been able to get a mention of fossil fuels or the need to get rid of them into an agreed document because the countries that have the most of them or have the most to gain by selling them um, or using them in their economies won't agree to it. And this is a unanimous process and they're always blocked. That agreement is always frustrated. Yet here they managed to get those words in. And presumably that does explain the reaction that we saw and we've just heard in the room. There are plenty of big international players at COP28, John Kerry, not the least of them, for of course, in the United States. Their response demonstrates a genuine appreciation for the effort that's gone in here. It's quite significant when you think about the fact at the beginning of this summit, a lot of people said, we're not getting anything. If anything, this might be the moment the fossil fuel industry just takes over the whole thing and we don't get anywhere because you got to remember the UAE is one of the world's largest oil exporters. They are very good friends with some powerful oil countries as well, like Saudi Arabia, which behind the scenes has always worked incredibly hard to stop any progress at these sorts of summits, along with oil lobbyists and things like that. Yet, here we find ourselves with the opposite happening, a kind of agreement that has eluded us thus far. A lot of people, John Kerry was one of them who said, you know, let's see if giving this over to an oil economy is actually what we need, a new way of negotiation, a new way of doing deals to get this agreement. That's the historic bit. But of course, we do have to talk about the caveats, what is not in this or the wording that is there that maybe makes this have to be pretty sceptical about where this actually leaves us in terms of the ultimate target of getting to keeping the world rather below a dangerous one and a half degrees of global warming. Tom, we'll, we'll deal with the, the semantics around transitioning away from, from oil and gas in just a second. But in terms of the rest of the communique, what is the detail of what is being agreed where you are? The transition away from fossil fuels. Those words, yeah, they're semantics. They mean nothing. They're not going to change the world. But it does send a very clear message home to governments and to investors, the people who are going to build energy systems for those governments, that fossil fuels aren't where it's going to be at. We're transitioning rapidly away from them. It's time to think about other things. That could build real momentum. We could see some exponential shifts. That's really, really positive. Another really significant thing, an agreement which had a lot of support, but we didn't think was going to get universal support from all the countries here, a tripling of renewable energy and a doubling of energy efficiency. Countries are now asked to, you know, to get on with that, to do that and deliver on that pledge. That's a really significant driver too. So those are two really important things that are going to push us forwards towards getting close to that net zero target by the middle of the century. There's some timelines in there as well. It does mention the need to do this, to get to net zero by 2050 and put some momentum there. And there's still language around coal saying, yeah, we've got to get rid of that. But the fact is it includes oil, gas and coal. So that's important. Let's deal with the, the big green elephant in the room. The, the fact that this communique deals with a transition away from, but not a phasing out of fossil fuels. Yeah. I mean, you've had the chairman of the UK's Environmental Audit Committee describing the communique as disappointing. You've had Antonio Guterres, the head of the United Nations itself, pointing fingers at those that didn't allow 
for that phasing out phraseology to go in. But I, I suppose the point to be made picks up on work that you have done, that actually, if we are to be moving towards net zero and all the rest of it, there is a need for hydrocarbons in many, many industries. So it, it would have to be a transition away from rather than a complete phasing out of if we're going to achieve these environmental goals. So the diplomacy first, phasing out was never going to get agreed here. Mm. Saudi Arabia would never have allowed that, nor would India, nor would lots of actually poorer African countries who are suffering the most from the effects of climate change. How can they be told you're not allowed to burn coal to grow your economies? You've got to try and borrow money at much less competitive rates than us, the rich countries, to invest in renewables. They weren't going to sign up for that either. So, yeah, it's what the science calls for, but it was never going to get agreed diplomatically. And then there's this pragmatic point. 80% of the world's primary energy comes from fossil fuels. We need to get off that really, really fast, but you can't just switch it all off. You'd have major, major shocks. In terms of a, pr a practical, pragmatic transition, mm. you're going to need some fossil fuels continuing well into the next few decades to get there. The question is, how much wiggle room does this give people who don't really genuinely want to see that rapid transition away? And there's quite a lot of wiggle room in these documents. So how true is it when people like the UN's climate chief say that this is the, the beginning of the end for fossil fuels? I mean, it, is that correct? I mean, the, the communique itself makes reference to transitional fuels, natural gas, which, you know, by my reckoning, is still a fossil fuel, is still a polluter, isn't it? And again, that's another token offered to countries like Russia, for example, which has got a hell of a lot of gas to prevent them from blocking any agreement. So it's sort of two steps forward, one step back on that particular point. The idea being, I suppose, if you're an optimist, you're looking at this optimistically, this sends that clear message. That could force the clean energy transition to run away from us in an exponential way. And the fossil fuels, they'll take care of themselves. They'll become less competitive. People will invest in them. It's fine. Glass up empty. There's so much wiggle room in here. That won't send a strong enough message. There will still be subsidies for fossil fuels. It will still be cheaper to exploit and burn those. And we won't get anything like the reductions that we need. And they are enormous to avoid one and a half degrees of warming we'll overshoot it massively and possibly never be able to remove enough carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the future to avoid really dangerous levels of climate change beyond two up to three degrees of warming i suppose then i can understand the environmentalists who have accused cop 28 of being riddled with with mixed signals i think it's fair to say that the fossil fuel dependent countries or the fossil fuel rich countries coming away from this agreement will be quite happy thinking, look, there's nothing in here that stops us from doing what we're doing now. We'll have to recognise that we're going to have to change the way we do things, maybe invest in carbon capture technology, which, by the way, doesn't really exist. Certainly anything like the scale, we're going to need it yet. We could also maybe make our gas a little bit cleaner by not emitting so much when we produce it. The question is whether that sets the direction of travel and not very much changes here. Or, as the real optimists would say, the John Kerry's of this world, the signals out there, we will now see a rapid transition. The business community, the investors, they will lead us in that direction and oil will gradually fizzle out. Interesting point to raise, however, John Kerry sat in there congratulating everyone on a job well done. The US signed a historic number of new licenses for oil and gas this year. They're still the world's largest producer of oil and gas. And we've got the UK as well, as you well know, we're sort of expanding oil and gas licenses too. So there is a bit of double dealing and a little bit of hypocrisy going on here too. It's all about really the message this sends. The words alone aren't going to change the world. Tom, just pause there for just a second. When we come back, we will be examining exactly what the developed world has to do as a result of COP28, but also the developing. Back in a second. And we're back in Dubai with our science and technology editor, Tom Clark. And the questions we need to be asking now are what happens next, really? Because, of course, the old argument has been that developed nations like the United Kingdom benefited from the Industrial Revolution, benefited from decades, you know, over a century, in fact, of using fossil fuels to, to become the country that we are right now. The developing nations have not had that opportunity in a very real and practical sense it will be the developing nations that have to pay, either financially or in terms of low productivity or, or whatever else, but it will be them paying for it far more than we will. Developing countries can quite rightly expect the rich ones to put their words into action. They've signed up to this ambitious deal. They've signed up to a rapid transition away from fossil fuels. They're going to want to see them do that and not prevaricate. And yet we've got a situation in the UK right now where we're doing, historically done quite a lot, but we are still not on course to meet our own 
commitment to this UN process. And that matters. If rich countries like the UK, which has invested heavily in renewables and talks the talk on the global stage, if we can't put it into action, it sends a very bad signal. Same for the US and other rich countries. But the other thing we're going to need to see is more action on finance, money from rich countries to poor ones for two things. The first one is adaptation. How do they adapt to the, the dangers, the threats of climate change that are coming at them, caused not by them, but by you know, wealthy countries' pollution? So they expect adaptation finance. And that was pretty thin on the ground here, but also money to help them develop their economies more cleanly. They have to borrow money at 30%. Rich countries borrow it much more cheaply. Where's the help that they're going to get to make those expensive upfront investments in cleaner energy? Look at a country like Colombia, for example, rich in coal, very clearly here saying we want to transition. We do not want a coal dependent economy, but we can't afford to do it without some kind of support. Where's that going to come from? And we haven't seen that yet. Tom, as you well know, I'm very much a, a glass half full of pure glacier water type of guy. But, but haven't we been here before? It, doesn't all it take is one change of president in the White House and the wheels come off this? Or another leader of any other government. And there are also, obviously, remember countries who will sign up to things here and find ways of not really committing to them as well. So it's not unreasonable to be very cynical about it and to think, really, what have we achieved? It's just words. I think the positive answer to that is the message it sends. And every climate summit, we've moved a little bit forward. We've taken steps. This has been a reasonably big one, I think, because of the language, but it's still no way near enough to get the kind of action we need. I think that the IEA, the International Energy Agency, has analyzed all the commitments made in this most recent agreed text, gets us about 30% of the cuts that we need to get to a 1.5 degree targets. So we're still a very, very long way away. And that's if everyone does everything they've signed up to, which we know they're not going to do. But you know, on that positive note, if it sends that message, if it somehow stimulates some exponential shift, and let's remember, we have seen that. Let's go to China, where we're now seeing the possibility of their emissions peaking maybe next year, something they hadn't planned to do for till 2030 anyway. You know, we're seeing that happen earlier. We're seeing costs of renewables coming down. We're seeing price rises linked to fossil fuels turning people off oil and gas look at the uk and the, a lot of people wanting to switch to heat pumps uh, despite the efforts of many to campaign against them you know we could see things transition really quickly and this could be very much part of the signal that helps that happen but at the same time the pace at which things are happening by the un process we are not going to get there another important thing that's that's sort of being missed in the noise here even if we do pretty much everything we can possibly think of to cut emissions at the moment one and a half degrees of global warming. We've got a 50-50 chance of reaching it within six years. We are almost certainly going to overshoot one and a half degrees at some point in the next couple of decades as well. We remember those heat waves, 50 degrees centigrade on every continent this summer, that was an average of 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So we're gonna to get to 1.5, it's gonna be rough. The question is, will we be able to overshoot it and come back you know, through carbon capture, more forests, doing things very, very differently? waiting for the planet to sort of reabsorb that carbon dioxide, bring things back down, or do we hit tipping points that push us over? That's the scientific reality of where we are, even with the steps forward made here in Dubai. In a sentence, those claiming that this was the day that the planet was saved, they're wide of the mark, at least for now anyway. Remember, everyone's been here for two weeks, they're exhausted, they've been up all night, they're exhausted, and things tend to get a bit hysterical. These are just words, and the words alone are not going to save the planet. It's more about the, the reinforcement of the noise in the room and the direction of travel. And the reason I think this is significant and historic, even though it's you know, not going to save the world in one agreement, it reinforces that message. He's definitely piling more information on that. If that message continues to go back to capitals, and now we've got 190 plus countries going home with that message ringing there is, things could change much more quickly than we think. And that is not an unreasonable thing to say, seeing as what we've seen with renewable technologies. But to say that, yes, one agreement is going to change everything is definitely an over-exaggeration. Tom, loving your analysis, also loving your definition of a sentence. We'll let you get back to do the mopping up of <laughs> COP28. <laughs> Thanks very much, Neil. Goodbye. And that's your lot for this edition of the Sky News Daily. Uh, much more, of course, from Tom on the feet on the issues uh, that we've just been discussing. Uh, but we'll see you next time.